Rabies can be absolutely terrifying, and some would even go as far as to say that it can create literal zombies. And in today's video, we're going to find out if that's true by taking a look at the cadavers and looking at the various organs and tissues that are affected by the rabies virus, as well as discuss the many symptoms associated with it. And more importantly, what is so unique about the prevention and treatment of rabies? It's going to be a little bit of a scary one. So let's jump into this anatomical and physiological awesomeness. So what is rabies? Rabies actually translates to madness or rage, which is a pretty good description based on what this disease can do. The rabies is a disease that is going to typically be caused by the rabies virus, although it can be caused by other viruses. But regardless of the exact virus, those are all going to be examples of what are known as Lissa viruses. And Lissa is going to translate to violent, which again is going to be pretty telling about what this disease is capable of. But even today, rabies still kills anywhere from 50 to 70,000 individuals worldwide each year. Rabies is an example of what's called a zoonotic disease, meaning that it's transmitted from animals to humans. Although there have been some cases of direct human to human transmission, but this is extremely rare. And so by far and large, it's again going to be transmitted from animals to humans. And this is specific to mammals. So it could be transmitted from animals like cattle, cats, raccoons, skunks, with dogs being the most common transmitter throughout the world, but bats being the most common in the United States. And this is mostly due to widespread use of rabies vaccines in pets and wildlife throughout the United States. The rabies virus is neurotrophic, meaning that it's specifically adapted to attack the nervous system and we'll see that it does a number on the brain. And this actually plays a pretty big role as to why it's so difficult to treat. Details that we'll learn about in just a minute. But as a teaser, if symptoms have already started, there have only been a handful of people who have survived the infection. And that's why you'll commonly see it being described as being nearly 100% fatal if someone has already developed symptoms. And that's why timing of treatment is so important which leads us to discussing the incubation period and transmission. Rabies is transmitted through the saliva of an infected animal, and this is typically through a bite, but it can also be through scratches or licks on open wounds or mucous membranes. The incubation period refers to the time between exposure to the virus and the start of symptoms. So in other words, the time it takes from being bitten to the time when symptoms start to show up. And rabies has a long incubation period, averaging around one to three months. However, there have been cases where people have started to display symptoms in just a few days after being bit, and then there are other cases where it's taken multiple years. Like there was a case of a man being bitten by a dog in Brazil eight years prior to developing symptoms. Yes, that's kind of freaky, but that is a very rare case. So now let's trace the pathway of this virus from bite to brain. So let's say someone gets bit on the arm, and here you're looking at an arm with the skin removed the virus actually will start to replicate in the muscle tissue. But remember, muscle tissue isn't its main target. And so the virus doesn't replicate as quickly in muscle tissue. And this is one of the reasons why the incubation period is so long. However, muscles are highly innervated with nerves. So eventually, the virus will enter peripheral nerves. Let's just say it enters this ulnar nerve that you can see here. And this is where you could start to develop symptoms such as numbness and tingling signaling that the rabies virus has made it into the nervous system. Plus, you can start to develop other symptoms such as a fever. But once the virus has made it into a peripheral nerve, it will then migrate in a retrograde direction or proximally through the nerves in the arm at about 50 to 100 millimeters per day until it reaches the spinal cord. Rabies viruses then replicate and ascend rapidly up the spinal cord and into the brain. Now, I do wanna repeat that the incubation period and this overall process of getting from bite to brain averages about one to three months. But sometimes it can take longer than that and sometimes it can be shorter. And one thing that does lend itself to a shorter incubation period, or in other words, the virus getting from the initial bite to the brain more quickly, could be if someone got bit in an area of the body that was more richly innervated with nerves and blood vessels, like the head and neck. And so bite locations should always be considered. But no matter the bite location, once the virus gets to the brain, this is where a big problem becomes a huge problem. 
The rabies virus will replicate rapidly in the brain and this triggers progressive inflammation and encephalopathy, which if you translate encephalopathy, it translates to a disease or condition of the brain. But this is going to result in the symptoms of rabies. Now the classic presentation of encephalitic rabies includes fever, hydrophobia, pharyngeal spasms, with periods of hyperactivity and aggression, fading to coma and eventually death. Now all of us have a pretty good idea of what a fever is, but what is going on with the hydrophobia? Because hydrophobia is the most characteristic feature of rabies and occurs in the majority of cases. Hydrophobia is a fear of water. Like, they legitimately develop this overwhelming terror of water. And this happens because rabies causes involuntary pharyngeal muscle spasms during attempts to drink. And the pharyngeal muscles are the muscles that make up your throat. And as the disease progresses, even the sight or mention of water may trigger these involuntary spasms. Now in some people, even a large draft of air from a deep breath can also trigger these pharyngeal spasms. And so this can also cause aerophobia or a fear of air. But this is not nearly as common as hydrophobia. You can also get autonomic overactivity and the autonomic nervous system automatically controls smooth muscle and glands. And in the case of rabies, this can affect the sweat glands, resulting in sweating, the lacrimal glands, causing excessive production of tears, and the salivary glands, causing increased salivation. And we definitely know that this virus is shed in the saliva, hence how it can be spread through bites. Agitation and combativeness are also common. Now let's be clear here. It's not like an individual with rabies has this unstoppable craze for violence, like they're going to be chasing you forever and ever like a zombie trying to take a bite out of you. Yes, the person can become aggressive and maniacal, but this is episodic, without them making it their sole mission to take a chunk out of you. Again, episodic, and this is often followed by periods of calm. And eventually, the person will slip into a coma and unfortunately die. And people typically die in the coma due to asphyxiation and respiratory arrest because of muscular spasms or uncontrolled generalized seizures. Now, all of the symptoms I just mentioned were considered encephalitic rabies, but about 20% of rabies patients develop paralytic rabies and tend to not have many of the symptoms that we just mentioned, but rather have this ascending paralysis from the bite location, and they typically die due to paralysis of the respiratory muscles. So as you can see, this is a pretty horrific disease. And again, it almost always leads to death, with only about 30 to 34 documented survivors worldwide. And most of those survivors are left with severe neurological damage. So does this mean it's all gloom and doom? Well, no, because you can prevent rabies and even prevent it after someone has been bitten or infected with the virus, if you act quickly enough. There is a vaccine for rabies. However, this is not a routine vaccine given in the United States, at least not to humans, because as I mentioned earlier, we do vaccinate our pets and other animals routinely. And this has made it so we have very few cases in the United States. So typically, we only consider vaccinating someone for one of two reasons. One, they're going to travel to a place that has a higher risk of rabies. And I actually do travel visits with some of my patients that are going to travel to different parts of the world. And if they're going to go to an area where they may be at higher risk for rabies or in contact with bats or potentially infected animals, we'll consider giving them the vaccine. And this would be considered pre-exposure prophylaxis. The other reason we would give it to somebody is for post-exposure prophylaxis, meaning this person got bitten by an infected animal or their mucous membranes came in contact with the saliva of an infected animal. But sometimes people get bitten and they don't know the status of that animal. So in those cases, the vaccine could also be given as a precautionary post-exposure prophylaxis. Now this is actually kind of interesting because a lot of the times you don't think of being able to get a vaccine after you've been exposed or infected by a virus. Like you wouldn't try to give someone a chicken pox vaccine after they were exposed to chicken pox. But this is where the rabies virus long incubation period helps. You have time to develop antibodies before the virus gets into the nervous system. But remember, the incubation period can still vary and be shorter in some people. So you do not want to wait. After a known exposure, you want to get this vaccine as quickly as possible because it will take another 7 to 14 days for the body to create antibodies after the vaccine is given. And because of this 7 to 14 day delay, sometimes people will also receive rabies immune globulin with the vaccine. And this rabies immune globulin is essentially antibodies derived from pulled plasma samples of hyperimmunized human donors or from horses. And if you get this post-exposure prophylaxis on time and before symptoms of clinical rabies begins, 
the outcomes are extremely good. There has only been one case in the United States where post-exposure prophylaxis was unsuccessful, but that was an 84-year-old that was immunocompromised. So if you do get bitten by an animal, you definitely want to clean and irrigate the wound as well as get as much information about the animal as you can. Obviously, if it's a flying animal like a bat, it's hard to get the health history of that animal. And so you definitely want to go into the clinic or get in contact with the health department to assess if post-exposure prophylaxis is the correct option for you. I'm assuming that most of you watching these videos have embraced your inner nerd and truly love to learn. And one of my favorite learning platforms that I continue to use to brush up my skills is Brilliant. Like, I've been accused of being a super nerd by my family multiple times for using the Brilliant app for fun while I'm just hanging out, or even when I'm at an amusement park waiting in line, because who wouldn't want to learn while waiting in line at an amusement park? And Brilliant has been a sponsor of ours for years, because Brilliant aligns with our values of learning at any stage in your life, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, data analysis, and even AI. These lessons are designed to be uniquely effective, as Brilliant's first principles approach builds understanding from the ground up through problem solving and engaging hands-on exploration, all of which are extremely important for not only learning new information, but also retaining it and helping you to become a better thinker so that you can do the most important thing, which is to apply your knowledge to real-world situations. And the science nerd in me continues to geek out about Brilliant Science courses, as these courses help you to make sense of our universe at every level, from the mechanics of simple machines all the way up to the mind-bending physics of black holes. And so if you want to learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash IHA, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant is also giving our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Thanks again to Brilliant for supporting the channel. Thank you to all of you for watching our content about the human body. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.